extra time. Hello and welcome back to the Extra Time Podcast. It's me, your host, Patrick Van Straten, and this week I'm joined by Joe Tomlinson, who let's is go. in kind of Christmas hype beast mode. How are you, Joe? Yes, let's go. Christmas is just around the corner. Boris may have stuck us firmly into Tier 4, but nevertheless, I've just seen Manchester United slap six past Leeds. Absolutely delightful scene. So <laughs> it's perked me up a bit, Pato. How are you, mate? Um, I can't remember the last time I saw my team score six. Um <laughs> Have, have we even scored six since the beginning of the season? It doesn't feel like we Def- have. Like, definitely not. <laughs> there's a, it, the thing is, if you told me that we wouldn't get relegated for sure, I'd probably relax a little bit and, wouldn't, and, and would kind of enjoy the rest of the season. But I'm genuinely a little bit fearful. On the other hand, we're not in the relegation zone and it's hard to imagine us getting worse. Yeah, you'll but... be fine. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, you know. I look at Sam Allardyce coming in. Maybe we should have got Big Sam in and everything would have been fine. I think you just, it, once you start scoring some goals, mate, because at the moment you scored one less goal than Fulham. So, I mean, when, when the goals start in the net, maybe get Bobby Deck or Dover Reed in in January and you might start scoring some goals. Is that is that your is that your big <laughs> shout for Arsenal's attacking midfield signing in January? No, no, absolutely not. Fear mud for Arsenal in January. I don't know where you turn. I think the, the Brexit like changes of the Brexit rules might mean you might end up fishing around South America. I reckon you see a lot of South American signings in January. Well, or the championship. I mean, of course you have been linked with Emiliano Buendia. Maybe that one, maybe we go in and spend the money there or try and get a loan deal just to to get around the rules. But it's, (laughs) it's not, it's not that exciting. Um, Well, today we're going to talk a little bit about, about our predictions for the forthcoming year in football because actually this is one of the few years where it's genuinely interesting to talk about what might happen um so i think probably we should start in an obvious place do you reckon we should start with who's going to win the premier league joe because yeah a few weeks ago i thought this was clear or at least my feelings had got clearer about it and now i'm unsure again um okay so i'm still pretty clear that i think liverpool are gonna uh, retain the title i don't see Mm -hmm. a team um even getting close to them to be honest with you i think they won't hit the heights of the 90 to 100 point mark again but that will still be enough for mid 80s like high 80s will still be enough for them and Mm -hmm. i actually thought watching the crystal palace game on the weekend i was getting quite concerned for the rest of the league i thought that was a real signal of intent by liverpool sort of firing up on all cylinders um even the likes of naby cater and that i just thought looked superb fabinho looks probably one of the best centre-backs in the league at the moment, so not too worried about the Van Dijk injury from their point of view. And even when they play Tottenham, who I guess some people might consider their closest rivals this season, or at least in and around the conversation as as a genuine rival this season, I thought they conceded big chances, but overall pretty dominant in the game. Um, so I think Liverpool put down a pretty big yardstick this week in the last sort of seven days. And I'm seriously scared about what they're going to do to some of the smaller teams now. Sort of Salah's firing. Bobby Firmino seems to have got his shooting boots back on. Sadio Mane's coming off the pitch after scoring, still looking like he's had the worst game of his life. So that's pretty good for me. I- I'm sticking with Liverpool. What about you? I overall do stick with Liverpool, but I do think that there are slight weaknesses there. I think before they before they went ahead in that Crystal Palace game, mm. they were in some danger. Like there was a, there were some genuine moments of Crystal Palace Definitely. causing them problems. And you know, you look at the scoreline at the end, and Liverpool do have that ability to accelerate out of problems. Um, to me, my bet on them winning the league comes down to my lack of confidence in any of their rivals. Like I think Spurs, I don't think Spurs at any point this season have really looked like title challengers except in the points tally. I think when mm. you've watched their games, when you've looked at their stats, they look kind of fourth or fifth best in the league. Chelsea by the stats look right up there with Liverpool, but when I watch them, I don't quite have that faith. You know, I do still see obviously there's an, there's another gear that they can get into mm. when they when Werner starts finishing, if Havertz comes into form, if Pulisic starts playing more, if Kovacic starts playing more. Um, so so Chelsea potentially look like the best rivals and Man City, you know, I wouldn't entirely rule them out, but I can't see it from Everton. I can't see it from Leicester. I can't see it from Southampton. And I can't see it from Spurs. So right now, Liverpool are the best placed points wise and they're the most consistent side in the league. And in theory, as people get fit, they should only get better. Yeah, I think the reason Man City, I don't think will win the league this year is I just don't think they've got that goal scorer. Um, Mm -hmm. I just don't, 
like Sergio Aguero's injury problems have now developed into what is almost a crisis at Man City in the forward departments. I think the last sort of two or three seasons they've been getting by with Sergio producing sort of 28 games a season or so and still scoring almost every every game or at least every other game. Um, whereas this mm-hmm. season it feels like, you know, is he even going to get 20 appearances? I think he scored eight goals in the calendar year, um, which is very un-Sergio Aguero-like. So I think maybe they miss a goal scorer. I, th- I agree with you on Tottenham. I don't believe Jose Mourinho's style of play is going to win that league title. It's too defensive against um, rivals. The Leicester game on the weekend really highlighted that. The- they're all over the place, I thought. Um, Leicester are unlucky not to win by more goals. And I thought Jose really struggled to get Harry Kane into the game um, towards sort of like 60 minutes onwards when Gareth Bale was born at half time. They were just slinging balls into to, to Kane and hoping he produced something. And then Didi kind of gobbles those up for Fana and Johnny Evans. Like that was their wet dream last night that balls were just going to be chucked in the air towards Harry Kane all day. Mm. So I think Spurs are a little bit dodgy. Um, and then, yeah, Man United and Chelsea. Um, like Man United, definitely one of the best counter-attack if not the best counter-attacking team in the league um yeah extremely dangerous in transition and maybe ollie doesn't get enough credit for setting traps because i certainly thought he set the right traps against leeds and exposed them pretty badly but also defensively even against leeds like there was three or four huge chances for bielsa's side to score goals so i think the defense costs united i think chelsea still too many players trying to be bedded into one side you know when you've got six Mm -hmm. players or so coming in it's a big influx to try and ask all of them to fit into one team all of them to play well every week um so yeah i think it'll be liverpool and then you sort of united chelsea tottenham city battling for that top four again leicester might stay up there but equally one injury to Vardy it always feels like just scuppers them or one injury to Madison scuppers them so uh, I'm backing Liverpool for the title but the top four is is wide open this year yeah I agree I mean the one thing about Leicester the one positive thing is that yes an injury is a real problem for them but they've got through this period Mm. keeping in touch with the top teams with a long absence for Madison a long absence for Ndidi Pereira's been out obviously Chilwell left so it does seem again kind of like with Liverpool, but on a smaller scale, there there is an edge that they can regain once those guys get fit again. But I'm I'm with you. I, I don't really feel like they've got the depth, given how congested this season is going to be as well. What about Everton? Because they're currently occupying fourth spot. Oh, do we think they're realistic top four contenders? Um, They've got some key injuries at the moment, and it's not the first time they've had key injuries this season. I've got to say, I thought they were pretty ropey defensively against Mm. Arsenal which actually I saw a lot of Everton fans say similar things and I think that a better team than Arsenal would probably have found a way to punish them I can't see them coming out of a game against a top half team unscathed in that match and they didn't really create a lot either like yes they were ahead for almost the whole game but that after that second goal though they had it looked like they were dangerous on the counter-attack they didn't actually create any chances against what we've got to say is a pretty ropey Arsenal backline so, again, they, to me, feel a little bit too fragile squad-wise yeah. um, to to get it done. But I think definitely a Europa League place should be the minimum they're aiming for. And in in a good year, James Rodriguez comes back and maybe, maybe fourth is in play. But I kind of doubt it. Yeah, I kind of agree with you there. I think Dominic Calvert-Lewin, I think his goals will probably be enough to get them into Europa League spot this year. If he, mm. if he hits 16 to 18 goals this season, which is looking pretty likely given he's on 11 and we're not even at Christmas, um, I, I would be surprised if Everton aren't in around that. If you look at like hist- what history says of where sort of top goal scorers around 20 mark finish, uh, generally the teams are finishing top eight. So I think Dominic Calvert-Lewin for me will be enough to propel them up. Because even against Arsenal, you know, the athleticism of the guy is just remarkable. Like, the balls are just being fired into him. He's jumping about 15 foot um, and flicking balls on. So even when they're not playing well, I think he's enough of an outlet to, to get them draws. And the last three games have been three huge results for Everton because Carlo Ancelotti sort of had a bit of a dip, didn't he? And I think people mm-hmm. were kind of saying, um, oh, what's going on here? Like, is is it all falling apart a little bit, but he's beaten Arsenal, Chelsea and Leicester in the last three games. Um, he's got Man United, obviously, in the, in the Carabao Cup. If he wins that, to have won those four fixtures in a row coming into Christmas is 
bloody impressive without James Rodriguez. So um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think I think I would be considering him definitely one of the favourites for Europa League and and closely challenging for top four potentially. Well, given that you've brought up Dominic Calvert-Lewin, perhaps we should move on to mm. who we see being the Premier League top scorer come the end of the year. Because before the weekend, when I first kind of started thinking about this this topic, um, I guess that it seemed a little bit less clear now. Whereas after the weekend, you know, Mo Salah scored a couple mm. of goals and now he's the second top scorer in Europe. It looks like he could potentially pull away. 13 in 13 now. Um, really quite frightening form from Mo Salah, despite being benched at the weekend. Yeah, I'll go Mo Salah. I'll agree with you. Um, Because I think Liverpool's problems aren't going forward, are they? Like Liverpool's effectively still the same forward unit that was rinsing Premier League, taking 200 points from the last two seasons or whatever ridiculous number they got to. Um, So, yeah, I think Mo Salah probably progresses and finishes on like 24 goals, something like that. Uh, And obviously takes pens, which helps always, doesn't Mm. it? Um, I do think Harry Kane will be pretty close. I know that he's obviously contributing in more ways than just goals at the moment. I think it's nine goals, 10 assists as we stand at the moment, which is just a frightening number. Um, But I do think he'll start to put together goals in the second half of the season, provided he can stay fit. Um, Jamie Vardy is obviously going to be up there, but just worried about game time with him and the tightness of fixtures given his age. So yeah, I'd stick with with Mo Salah. Mo Salah uh, first, Kane second, Vardy third. I'll go. Ooh, interesting. Well, I mean, hmm. I, on a kind of related note, I wanted to know what, what you think the odds are that Harry Kane breaks the assist record. What is it at the moment? Season. 20? It's 20. And he's, I think he's still on 10. He's on 10, yeah. Yeah. And obviously, what, 14 games gone? So mm. 24 games. He's still got to go at a pretty incredible rate, like almost one every other game to break it. But it's possible. I think it's definitely possible. He might get more assists than goals this season. I think even if he finished on like 17 goals, 17 assists, you'd be like, now that's ridiculous output um, for Harry Kane. Just even when like Spurs were struggling at the weekend against Leicester, there were moments where Kane picked up the ball, turned and like made something happen. And that's the sort of thing that immediately separates him from about... 85% 85% of the league the ability to do that and the beauty he has with assists it feels like every chance he creates for Son is Son scores like I, I don't mm. know what Son's like shot accuracy is but every one on one I'm like yeah it's, got, it's gonna be a goal um, and I just don't feel like that about many other players in world football um, I've got it mm. up here actually yeah he's got the best shot accuracy of any of the top well, top 20 goal scorers in the Premier League, 80% shot accuracy, just absolutely ridiculous. 58% goal conversion rate at the moment. Um, Wowza. The efficiency of the man is absolutely ridiculous. He's had 19 shots this season and scored 11 goals. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it's just scary, isn't it? Yeah, I, th- I think Kane stands a good chance of getting 15 plus in both goals and assists. Good God. I mean... Yeah, and I suppose that could go quite a long way to powering Spurs back up. But yeah, I'd, I don't know. I think he's got to continue at almost the same rate to do it. I'm mm. not sure. I, I'm not sure I see it, but it's clearly going to be his best creative season ever. Um, How old is Kane uh, now? 27, 28. Let's have a look. I've just Googled it. Yeah, he is 27, but he still feels and like Son's he's getting better. Like, do you know what I mean? Whenever I watch Kane, I'm like, he's improving. Well, he does this season. I mean, like the the last couple of years, that hasn't really been yeah, true, true, has it? True. But but he but he's back in form. I mean, speaking of form, I suppose we should turn our attentions to the mm. relegation battle. Okay. Um, so obviously, we're picking three clubs to go down. There are two nailed on ones, in my opinion: Sheffield United, Arsenal Football Club. <laughs> 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 no, who, who have you who have you got? I I mean, I I kind of feel like Sheffield are too far gone to rescue it. Yeah, I mean, she- like Sheffield United to get out of relegation at this stage, they-, they literally need Jesus on the pitch, don't they? It's not going to happen for them, I don't think. They're eight points off safety at the moment. Um, we're only a third of the way into the season, so never say never with the current state of the Premier League. But I just don't see where their goals come from. Um, I don't think McBurney and Brewster are going to score enough goals to get them out of trouble. McGoldrick is trying his best, bless him, but um, I don't think it's there. And defensively, <clears throat> the injury to Jack O'Connell's effectively killed the whole of Wilder's game plan. Um, 
He was yeah. so crucial to the way they played. Him and Dean Henderson. Um, that to lose both of them in this in the sort of space of a month has absolutely nuked that back line, really, to the level where you're having to see, you know, against Manchester United, Chris Basham playing central midfield um, when Sander Berger got injured. So I think there's massive problems all over the park for Sheffield United and they don't have the funds to fix them in January. They don't have the funds to get the right striker in or the right centre-back in in January. Um, Aaron Ramsdale, he's trying his best, but he, he's really not... Dean Henderson and it's becoming quite apparent quite quickly um, and they spent 19 million pounds on him didn't they and 23 million on Rian Brewster who I think has he scored a goal not too sure so there are summer recruitment I don't think so uh, the summer recruitment's been an absolute disaster for Sheffield United their two highest profile signings have just really really struggled um, so yeah they, they're, they're going down I don't see any way they survive I mean eight goals scored 25 goals conceded no, it's not happening for them. Um, West Brom, here's an interesting one. Is he going to do it, Pat? Because he's never been relegated, Big Sam. Is he doing it again? <sighs> I don't know, man. I mean, they've got they've got one win so mm. far this season. Um, they've scored ten goals in fourteen, and I think they've yeah. conceded they've conceded the second most in the league after Leeds. I think. Like Leeds yeah. have conceded 30, West Brom have conceded 29. Um, I don't feel good about this one because the thing is they're three points behind Burnley and and Fulham. They Burnley have got two games in hand. Yeah. And, what, and what Fulham have shown an ability to do this season is to score their way out of problems. Like They're not scoring a huge number of goals at the moment, but I think they've got 13 goals and XG says they should have scored 17. And I kind of look at them there and I think, okay... Is this going to make a difference against the top sides? No. But when it comes to your matches against Newcastle, against Sheffield United, I just think that they'll maybe be able to turn draws into wins. Plus, they've picked up a little bit of form recently. Now, I expect West Brom are going to be able to get organised under Big Sam. But I really struggle to see the talent. I just, yeah. I just, I, I have real, real concerns here. I mean, I think they've created under eight expected goals in 14 games, which to put it in context is half of what Arsenal have created. Half of what that Sheffield is, United have created. Yeah, that's really, really worrying to me. Um, so, I don't know. I don't like to bet against Sam, but this is a real uphill climb. Yeah. A real uphill climb. I, was, I mean, I caught some of the Aston Villa game yesterday and it it was not pretty. I think the, the, the size of the task, if Sam didn't realise it already will have become quickly apparent after that game because they were lucky not to lose four or five against mm. Villa um, with that obviously very close VAR decision. I th- I do think that he can immediately get better output going forward than Bilic did just by um, getting Pereira and Grady Diangana in the right roles. Like s- the state yeah. of some of the use of those two uh, under the back end of Bilic, he obviously got really good output out of him in the championship. Don't know why he was mixing up so much with them in the Premier League. I think there was a game when Pereira played like wing back, um, which mm. was just bizarre. Uh, so I think potentially you'll see that that uh, sort of expected goals climb fairly rapidly un- under Big Sam. My issue, like you, is like, does Carlin Grant score enough goals for them to to get them out of this problem? Um, oh, I don't think he does. Like, I think Sam Allardyce probably one club too many of trying to get in this get out of this relegation battle but it's still very early we might sit here in four weeks and go okay now Pereira's starting to score goals Grady Dean Garner's starting to chip in with a bit of creativity um the defense looks a lot more solid because Sam Johnson's a very good goalkeeper I think Conor Gallagher's putting up really good numbers in the midfield looks like a very, very talented lad um coming out of the Chelsea Academy so it's not impossible given that they are only three points off safety but it is going to be an uphill t- battle to get that forward line scoring goals. Um, so I would say Sheffield United and West Brom, for me, are the first two names down there. And then I think I'll go Fulham. Interesting. Uh, Interesting. Because I, I think this one's a real toss-up. Like, I mean, Between who? Between be them and Burnley? Fulham, Burnley, Arsenal. You're not actually considering you in there. Come on, Pat. Are you actually? Um with my head no with my heart a little bit 
you know. There's a few big games coming up for you here, isn't there? There's Man City and then there's Chelsea on Boxing Day. And though, like for me, they feel like huge fixtures for Arteta because if he loses five or six in either of those, I think it's unrecoverable now. Well, I think that... I mean, the City game's a bit of a gimme in a way because it's because it's a cup game. Mm. So, like, I think he could potentially play some youth there and, like, maybe get away with it. Chelsea is difficult because it's at home. Um, and I think then you kind of... If you lose at home, like, that tends to go down really badly. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised... If he loses to Chelsea and then he loses away to Brighton in the game after that, I would expect that probably to be the end for him. Um Though the game after that, Big Sam and Big Sam would love to get an Arsenal manager sacked. You know that. Yeah. So, um, but the thing is, if he does get, to, say, he gets a draw in the Chelsea game, then after that, Arsenal actually have an okay run. I think they've got Brighton, uh, Palace, Newcastle, and West Brom. Those are the those are the last uh, four games of this half of the season. So you could imagine if they manage to get say three wins out of that, then suddenly mm. we're looking suddenly we're looking at a team who are on track for, you know if they get a couple of draws, like they're on track for maybe 50 points as opposed to, you know, currently being on track for maybe 38 points. And that's a huge difference. Um, but I don't know, man, like the, the team at the moment, I'll, I'll actually say there were moments against Everton where Arsenal finally did things that we've been waiting for them to do. You know, like Willian, I thought Willian had a bad game, but at least in the second half, I saw moments where he was dropping deep in helping the midfield and and there were moments as well where Pepe was receiving the ball on the mm. half turn from Ceballos and I thought how are we three or four months into the season and seeing this stuff for the first time like it's we've seen Saka do it how is it only now we're seeing Pepe do it yeah. but I suppose the one thing that's positive really overall is that Arsenal have been playing this badly Getting a little bit unlucky as well. Not as unlucky as Arteta suggests, but a little bit unlucky. I think expected points puts Arsenal 11th in the league with like mm. 19 points, um, which kind of seems about right. I don't know. Um, and I think it's hard to imagine Arsenal playing much worse and getting much worse results than they have been getting. Yeah, like it's, a, it's difficult though, isn't it? Because like you, like you feel like there's so many players that just should be doing better. Mm. But it's almost like, uh, like, is it going? What's it going to take for all of them to start improving? Well, in a way, though, you don't need all of them to improve. You just need like a couple of guys to improve. And like Martinelli's back, I think he's going to play a bit. Obviously, you don't want to suggest he's going to be the savior of the season. But I think that he is a much more natural fit playing on the left with someone like Lacazette through the mm. middle than Aubameyang is playing on the left. So it at least gives a little bit of flexibility. If Arsenal can go and get some creativity in January, even if it's just, you know, a loan for someone like Ericsson, is that the dream for Arsenal? No. Will it improve them? I'm pretty certain, yeah, it would. Like any creative player is going to improve this side because they just have zero creativity at the moment. So so there are there are edges to be found. Party will obviously come back yeah. to fitness. That'll help. So I do think there are lots of ways they can get better. I suppose to believe they'd get relegated, you'd have to imagine that Arsenal stick with Arteta. They can't get in a decent player in January and they continue to play at this level and continue to get a little bit unlucky. And I suppose that's quite a lot of stuff that has to go wrong. But I think that when this much is going wrong, it's quite easy for big teams who don't expect to be here to mm. get into a spiral because their players are not prepared to fight. And a lot of these guys are leaving at the end of the season. So who knows, man? Yeah, and that dressing room feels like it's quite um, quite a tough place to be at the moment, doesn't it? I watched the interview yeah. of Arteta after the game and he, when he was kind of suggesting like, well, every dressing room has like sort of semi-factions and... I imagine Arsenal's ones are pretty divided right now. Um, yeah. From the reports, especially, I think, is it Socrates and Ozil, who were both senior figures and they've been left out um, of the squads. And it just feels like something has to change at Arsenal. I'm not sure whether it's Arteta or maybe above him. But um, yeah, I, I agree. I think they're going to be fine. Uh, when Partey's back, get somebody in in January. Um, Martinelli's back. Aubameyang physically cannot be this level for the entirety of the season. At some stage, Aubameyang will start scoring goals again. Um, so I think 
realistically, like in and around 10th spot, Arsenal end up finishing. Um, because even the teams that are above them, you know, like Newcastle, Palace, um, Leeds, like watching Leeds, they're so vulnerable, man. Like they are going to drop so many points this season. Newcastle under Bruce, so ropey. Um, so I think they'll be absolutely fine. Fulham, on the other hand, I, I think mm. will be victims of slight naivety. Um, from Scott Parker. I, I just think that that team, maybe it's not even Scott Parker's fault because I feel, feel like he's setting the team up the best he can, but it's just not quite of the level required. Um, it's so easy to get at Fulham through the, through the middle, even though Onguise is putting up these massive numbers and I feel like Anderson and Adarabai are actually playing okay. It just f- still feels like they get cut cut to shreds every time I watch them. Um, yeah. So I, I don't see them beating the drop when... Burnley are just going to scrub results, aren't they? Like one alls and one nils. Like even when they beat you, Burnley didn't really deserve it. I didn't think weren't particularly good, but just sort of scrubbed that result. Um, and yeah, I believe they'll they'll probably finish in seventeenth, Fulham in eighteenth. I think Brighton will like Brighton at the moment, obviously in sixteenth. Like can't buy a win. I think they've won two games all season, but they're like by expected points, they're like the fourth or fifth best team in the league, aren't they? So yeah. I, I don't know what on earth is going on at Brighton. They need to buy a goal scorer. But the thing is with Brighton, I feel like if they wore a different shirt, we'd say like they'd be getting a lot more attention mm. for what's going on. It's a little bit like that season, you know, Jurgen Klopp's last season at Dortmund where you watch them and they looked fine. Their numbers looked fine, but they were just somehow losing again and again and again. The thing is, no one really bats an eye because it's Brighton rather mm. than like Chelsea or something. But I don't know. Brighton, I think, will be fine. Yeah, they will. I'm, I'm going to slightly differ with you. I'm going to say that the last team to go down will be Burnley. Firm survive. Just because I, I think Burnley are going down. Yeah, I think, for, I think, I mean, it's on a knife edge, but Burnley have just created next to nothing this season. I don't know who their games in hand are against, but I have no faith in their ability to do anything in those games. <laughs> um, I think that maybe the talent drain has just been has just gone on too long. Like these guys have all got a year old, or they signed one thirty-one year old in the summer. That to me is like a bridge too far for Burnley. And if and I'll be I'll be stunned if they stay up. Yeah, fair um, enough. Fair. But yeah, a lot of bad teams this this season. So shall we go to the other end of the spectrum? Should we talk about the Champions League? Because the Champions on, League, I've got literally no idea. I mean, I'm going to... I don't trust pretty much any of the big teams in it, which makes me think mm. that it's really open for a team like Liverpool, who are just competent to go on a run and win it. Yeah, yeah I do know what you mean. I do think that the British fixture scheduling and the British lack of five substitutions is really going to hamper English teams in the in the Champions League. I think that mm-hmm. the ability to rotate four or five players every game week across Europe will come May be extremely significant. Um, so I think Liverpool might struggle just because of the nature of a Premier League battle with three substitutes versus potentially a Bayern who by about March, we'll be able to be rotating very frequently. Um, That's true. So I think Bayern, especially as they've pulled Lazio, I I, I quite fancy them to to roll Lazio fairly comfortably there. Um, I still think Atletico are going to cause Chelsea massive problems as well. I think if there's ever a season that Atletico are really like going to fancy it is this year um so mm-hmm. i think it'll be between bayern and atletico is my instinct just because the five substitutes i think is going to batter english teams do you have any confidence in man city they've pulled glad back in the in the no. round of 16 no really I, I have just no confidence in man city when it comes to european football at all like i wouldn't <laughs> be surprised to see them lose to munch and glad back um i just think without a striker of aguero's caliber that you don't win the Champions League. Like I think you need a, you you need a Lewandowski or an Aguero or, or or somebody of that level. Like even Luis Suarez probably tips it in Atletico's favour. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I just Man City a striker sure, and also Pep just tinkers too much when it comes to Europe, man. I, it happens every year. It's just going to happen again, isn't it? I think I'm going to go for Liverpool. I, I mean, Man Fair. City, I actually think I'm a bit more positive about City than you. I agree that Aguero is an issue, but they've got a couple of months to get him fit. And I think that over the last few weeks, we have seen 
Guardiola shut down the defense. Like the defense mm. recently has been John Stones. What's going on there? Really impressive. Yeah, I know. Finally, back in the lineup, and, and it's almost like he won the league with them when they won a hundred points. Like he's a totally competent defender, and and recently defensively, I think they've been really, really solid. And I think that goes a long way in the Champions League. And I also think mm. Gladbach. I really like Gladbach. I really like Marco Rosa, but. Gladbach are capable of like absolutely appalling performances sometimes. As yeah. we saw in the group stage, they would hammer Shakhtar and then just look miles and miles second best against Real Madrid. Um, so I think uh, I, I think I'll go Liverpool just because I think Liverpool are reliable. Liverpool yeah, are probably going to be good. Um, and some of these other teams, I'm like, are they good? Are they are they you know mid table sides who happen to be in the Champions League? I, I don't know. I don't really have faith. So I'm going to go for, for Liverpool, especially because I think Klopp just knows how to get it done. And they've got people coming back to fitness. Mm. Um, they won't be full strength because Van Dijk will be out. But even still, I think that they'll have enough. Yeah, I think Leipzig's a tough draw, but it's not an impossible draw either. Like, I, even mm. when United lost in Leipzig, there were times where a good team would really have got out of Leipzig and punished them pretty badly and like yeah. at Old Trafford they were totally punished um, by even remotely quality attackers let alone Mo Salah, Firmino and Sadio Mane um, so I think Leipzig could be on the end of a bit of a stuffing by Liverpool to be honest with you Well I'm hoping those those fixtures are actually good because I even though the group stage went to the wire to see who'd go through I actually found a lot of the fixtures in the group stage to be a little bit disappointing <laughs> There was a lot of, mm. you know, Lazio versus Marseille business, which I'm not really going to watch. Yeah. So I I'm, I, I'm kind of looking forward to the, the round of 16 just to see some good teams emerge and see what can actually happen. But um, okay then, on another kind of European football, I want to know who you think is going to win the Euros. Oh. And I, this could go in any direction. God. Goodness me. Um, I would have said that England's done a great chance before they decided not to bring in five substitutes again, which I just think is just going to hammer English teams into the ground um, and English players in particular. Um, so I don't think it'll be England. It's hard, it is just hard to look past France, isn't it? Like hmm. The France squad is just so deep. Uh, it feels like even with two or three major injuries, it just makes no difference um, to that team. I do think that the midfield is significantly weaker than it was at that World Cup. Like, I know that Kante's definitely having a bit of a renaissance um, in the last two or three months, but Pogba's not the player he was at World Cup 2018. Is Kante the player he was at World Cup 2018? Um, Ndombele has definitely improved in the last three months under Jose, but even then, mm, not sure overly. Um but it's then you've got guys like Tali- them, if Taliso's yeah, fit Taliso. and you've got Alwa who's who's improved. Like I mean, <clears throat> even still, you look at you look at and Rabio could deep. feasibly yeah, get deep. in. Yeah, like there's so much depth in that in that French side. Even guys like Nkunku, you know, like okay, Dimitri Payet is maybe aged aged out. You can mm. bring in Nkunku <clears throat> or Diaby or someone. Like I mean, it's it's really. It, I mean, the the annoying thing is you know Deschamps is going to play. Uh, Giroud through the middle and yeah. it's just going to be like quite depressing but I think that I think that pragmatic sensible football tends to win international tournaments yeah I think Portugal have got a pretty good shot they've got I really like the Portuguese mm. team um, Cristiano obviously approaching one of his last ever international tournaments he's going to be bang up for it I think like Pedro Neto is he Portuguese if he is then yeah. they stand a good chance everybody knows that he's sensational um, and they're, they're just in a tough to group, break though. down, aren't they? I haven't they're actually seen group. the Euros groups. Let's have a look. I'm loading I, them up now. I think France's group has Germany and Portugal in it. Oh, so whoever so gets through that, group not France's. Top. France have got Switzerland, Albania, Romania. Um, oh. in the in the Portugal group, or am I looking at? Oh no, I am not. I, I'm looking at bloody 2016. An absolute whiffer. Uh, yeah, France, <laughs> Germany, Portugal, Hungary. Poor old Hungary. Yeah, that's going to be a tough one for Dominic Zaboslai. But Belgium, what about I, Belgium? I, I just I can't put any faith in Roberto Martinez. I just can't do it. I know they've got talent, but I think at the World Cup, 
I thought mm. they were lucky to get as far as they did. Since then, they've seen Vertonghen age out. They've seen Company completely age out. They've seen uh, Ed Nazar have a massive, massive dip in form. Dries Mertens is a lot older. Axel Witzel is older. Like It just feels to me like, mm. yes, De Bruyne, De Bruyne is still great and Lukaku's in the form of his life, but a load of other players have really taken a dip. Even Thomas Meunier is having a terrible season um, at Dortmund. So I, I, don't, I don't really see it for Belgium, but it's possible um the I Germans mean, Italy and the well. Netherlands Germany it, I think they'll be better than people expect because they obviously had mm. that horrific result against Spain recently but I would have more faith in Spain maybe like Spain I think have got a really interesting deep squad as well I don't think it's as good as France's but Spain always turn up to tournaments pretty pretty solid I mean the Netherlands and Italy are going to try and try and do something like you imagine that they'll go and play pretty ambitious football because they've been away from the international scene for a while but i don't think the netherlands have enough and italy i don't know actually italy have a very good manager and they now have a very good squad so maybe italy is a, a dark horses what but do you, what I can't do you see think them. of england's england's chances from a more neutral perspective um I think they're pretty solid. Like, I mean, if, if France were to go out of that of that group, which is perfectly possible, then I think you could make a reasonable case that England have the best squad left in the tournament. Mm. Um, you can play in so many different ways. You've got so many good attackers. Um, and, and yeah, if the defence is even halfway competent. Yeah, I'd probably say that after France, England are my, my second favourite. Wow. Just because Rashford's in great form, Kane's in great form, Sterling isn't, Sancho isn't, but Grealish is. You know, like, this is the thing about that England squad now. You're at a point where one or two forwards drop out of form and you can bring in another two who are yeah. in form. You know, Dom Dominic Calvert-Lewin, we'd expect to go. Um, like, even Vardy would deserve to go at this point. Like, that's so much depth um, that it's just really hard to see how you don't blow away the weaker sides and at least managed to create quite a bit against the better sides mm. and of the better sides relatively few of them look defensively solid right now yes yeah, it's, it's an interesting one isn't it yeah I, i'm gonna stick with france i think I, I like just can't look past the depth i'll go france i'll go france as well but i do think that um i would not be surprised if england win it at all imagine imagine dream pow <laughs> what if they win it at wembley as well oh don't after beating scotland in the groups bloody hell <laughs> No, all I want is the Netherlands to beat England in the final. Uh, that's <laughs> that's all I'm dreaming of. Pain. Should we move on then to a final point? I well, wanted to know if you have a shock of the season in mind. Oh, goodness me. What, like a shock result or a shock player or position? Could or... be a shock result, shock player, shock sacking. Um, it could be, you know, Arsenal getting relegated. It could be uh, somebody signing somebody, you know, like Liverpool signing a Mbappe or something unexpectedly. Who knows? Mm. Is there anything that you think could happen in 2021, which would come as a genuine surprise to people? Um, well, at the start of the season, sacking Arteta would have felt like a massive surprise, wouldn't it? Like, I think mm. he would have been one of the longest odds in the league, probably, after winning the FA Cup. Um, but now it feels like less of a shock, doesn't it? I mean, if he was to go now, I don't think anybody would be over, would be overly surprised just because of how poor the football is at the moment so yes. i won't i won't say uh Mikel arteta um i think dominic calvert lewin could end up with the golden boot which i don't think anybody would have said at the start of the season and probably wouldn't necessarily Ooh. say now um if he hits 20 goals there's absolutely every chance that he could win the golden boot as if mo salah picks up an injury or slows down or anything like that he stands every chance uh especially when james rodriguez is back fit and firing and feeding him five chances game uh, because his finishing and his movement to get into positions within the six yard box has been sensational this season uh, people mm. started calling him a tapping merchant which is probably a compliment to Dominic Calvert-Lewin in terms of his positional sense of movement in and around the box um, because there's a reason he's scoring goals from six yards out and plenty of other strikers don't uh, yeah so yeah I'll go Dominic Calvert-Lewin golden boot potentially as my shock Even interesting I think it'll be Salah <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it would be it would be a shock, but it's, it, it, it would be a remarkable achievement for Ancelotti to have come in, you know, with a guy who was regarded as like talented, but really a bit of a workhorse and to have turned him into one of the most complete strikers in the league. I mean, you could imagine him going to a big side and really being a threat because he is, like you said before, he's one of those guys, he's obviously a different sort of player to Firmino, but he's like Firmino in that 
even when he isn't scoring, he contributes so much to his yeah. team, winning free kicks, getting them up the field, even defending set pieces. So I, I would love to see some personal success for Dominic Calvert Lewin. Um, mine, I think, I think, I think Barcelona are going to miss out on the top four in Spain. Yeah, um, that's a great shout. That's a great shout. I would definitely agree with that. Well, they're in touching distance at the moment, but it, it just feels like Atletico and Real Madrid are both better than them and as deep as them. And then the other sides are maybe not as deep, but Sociedad are better than them, Villarreal are better than them, Sevilla are up there and I think are still ahead of them right now. Um, I don't think there's enough pace in that side when Ansu Fati's out unless they play Dembele. I think that the defence has got way, way worse. Mm. They haven't been pressing at all this season. I was actually looking at this for a, for a video on um, what's changed under Koeman and why they're doing so badly. And under Valverde and Setien last season, you know, when they had two managers in the course of the season, they pressed the least in their own defensive third, pressed a bit in the middle third, and then pressed really, really hard in the final third. They actually... Uh, we're really good at winning the ball back in the final third. And this season, I think they're 20th, 20th and 19th across those thirds. They've just completely let the let the pace drop off. And as a result, they're conceding bigger chances themselves and creating smaller chances for their forwards. The distance that their shots come from goal on average has moved a yard further out compared to last season. Um, Mad. And... And that's a real problem because what do we associate Barcelona with? It's getting those incredible uh, chances in the box that have like a 99% chance of going in, you know, mm -hmm. like the tap-ins. So I, I fear for Barcelona this season. And if they do miss out on the Champions League while building this stadium, when Lionel Messi is going to depart on a free, woo, I, I don't know what's going to happen to them. I think, I think a real implosion could be coming. Yeah, I think that could be a good one as well. It's a shock of the season. Messi to sign a pre-contract with Man City, by the way. Like, would not surprise me at all if you Ooh. see an agreement made in January between him and, him and Man City and mm. uh, him then joining the summer without much other business happening at Man City. Because I don't think they need loads of other business, but it no. does feel like there's a bit of a messy shaped hole in this Man City squad after the Aguero Definitely. injury um, that could well be filled with one... A uh, foul swoop of Tiki Begara Stan's hand in January, uh, and obviously the elections aren't until when March, February, end of March, or something. Like I that. think so. Um, so I think Messi probably would have made his mind up by the time whoever comes in comes in, and whoever comes in is going to have to tell Messi he's going to have to take a pay cut anyway, isn't he? There's no way he can continue on a million pound a week yeah. at Barcelona because there will no longer be a club. Uh, so I think he might sign a pre-contract with Man City in January. Oh, I would love to see Messi come to the Premier League next year. It'd be amazing. Yeah, it, it genuinely would, wouldn't it? I mean, I saw Neymar kind of running his mouth and being like, oh, let, let's please play together. Please, let's play together. I don't think he'll go. I'm hoping he don't go to PSG, please. It'd be so boring. It'll be so boring. And I think Mbappe, is Mbappe going to sign a new deal? I think Mbappe's going to... They don't even know who's going to be the manager in the summer. So, I mean, I think that I think the lure of Pep and playing with De Bruyne will be, will be too much Fingers for Messi. Crossed. Fingers yeah, crossed. Yeah, hopefully. Do you have any other final predictions before we wrap up? I, I feel like we've covered quite a lot of things, but I wanted to know if you have anything else. Um, Not really, to be fair. I'm trying to rack my brains now. Uh, who do you think will win the Player of the Year award? That's a great question. Because it's obviously hard to look past Harry Kane at the moment, right? Because he's, he's scoring goals, he's getting assists, and he's doing it in a Jose Mourinho team that's quite defensive as it is. Um. But, but I think but I think if their results start to drop off at the end yeah. of the season, it doesn't matter if his personal performance has stayed at the same level. People might be people people would say, oh, they were competing for the title. Now they're not. Yeah. Um, and might see that as a failure as opposed to they were lucky to be in the title race. Most um, Salah then maybe or Sadio Mane or one of that Liverpool team that is sort of if they end up being uh, like unbeatable throughout the rest of the season and go on a real run. I, yeah, maybe. But I also think that if it comes down to a British player and a non-British player, the league and the fans and the players always choose British players. They yeah. just love it. They absolutely love it. They never shut up about it. And that makes me think that the three contenders who I have in mind at the moment are Kane, Grealish, yeah. wow. and Bruno Fernandes. Wow. Okay. Um, and I think Bruno Fernandes deserves to be up there, definitely. Grealish... It's unlikely Grealish ends up being the best player in the league. But I mean, if he, again, has a tear at just the right time, mm. 
as the votes come in, you could see it happening, right? I could see it end up being like Bruno, Kane, Salah, and Salah winning it just because Liverpool win the double and he scores 25 goals or something. Um, mm-hmm. Would be what I would go instinctively. Uh, what about young player of the year? Oh, God. Uh, who won it last season? Trent. Yeah, that, that does make sense. <laughs> um, um, big could, Ken, be, could, Pedro be, Neto? <laughs> could be Diogo Jota. Could be. Um, He'd still be eligible. Rashford, obviously, going to be even that's come ins- the next summer. Insane. People are still going to be talking about Rashford as being like the nation's darling, aren't they, at the moment? So I think he could be a good shout of, of getting a lot of votes amongst writers and fellow professionals just for like off the field as much as on it, even if he finishes with like 10 goals, 10 assists. It just feels like <laughs> it, it's easy to forget that Rashford is still eligible for it because he's been around for so long. But yeah, yeah I think I think you're right. Like, I mean, Rashford... Rashford's like taken such a leap forward in the last kind of 18 months. Like I would obviously be delighted for Marcus Rashford to win it. Yeah, I think I think that maybe he and Jota would be would be the forerunners for it. Um, Reese James as well, potentially he's putting together a very, very solid season quietly. It's hard to win it as a defender though. Yeah, isn't it? isn't it? It really is. And like Trent won it last year, but it was so exceptional. What did he finish on like 13 assists or something from right back? I think he set the record for the most defensive assists in history, didn't he? So Calvert Lewin though as well. Calvert Lewin, as as we've obviously talked about, like he's eligible for it, and I think that Ooh. he would have a pretty good chance. Obviously, if he Definitely. hits, if he hits twenty goals, then maybe he will be, then then it might be his to lose. Yeah, t- I actually totally for- forgot Calvert Lewin would be eligible. Then if if he is eligible and he scores twenty, he's nailed on, guaranteed. They can't give it to anyone else. Nice. Well, I think that basically wraps us up. All right, Those nice. are our predictions for the year. So I'll be intrigued to see how stupid we end up looking. Um. Joe, is there anything that we should point people towards that they could enjoy over Christmas? Uh, Yeah, I mean, go and watch Sunday Vibes. We've got loads of them coming out over Christmas. We did one on Boxing Day. We've got one coming out on January the 3rd. I think the Boxing Day one is Arteta versus Lampard. So fingers crossed he's still in a job. Else that one's in the mud. (laughs) I I mean, I don't think he'll get sacked over Christmas, but who knows? Just because it'll be hard to do it over Zoom. But... um... (laughs) Yeah, I think I think that's basically all that I've got to point to as well. Like we've recorded all our Christmas content now. So thank you very much for your support this year, uh, for listening to us as an audio podcast and for subscribing to the video feed as well. Make sure that if you listen to it normally that you subscribe to the video feed too. It really does help us out. And thank you very much for continuing to watch during this year. We've appreciated everything that you've done, despite all our talk about Manscaped, which got very graphic at times. Mm. <laughs> so joe happy christmas happy new year cheers buddy have a good one thanks very much see you later guys, guys. bye